delighted to welcome uh, Judge J.J. Costello of the Cleveland Heights Municipal Court. I know there is a personal and professional connection here. We're delighted to have him here to administer the oath. So the oath is up at the podium. If you'd like to come to the center, wherever you feel most comfortable to uh, administer the oath, um, that is our next item on the agenda.
Thomas E. Powell Wolf. Michael, I, Mr. Berry, I, Mr. Wise, I, Mr. Wise, I, very good. Those minutes are approved as well. Uh, next up on the agenda is comments from the audience. Speakers are limited to five minutes. Total time allowed, 15 minutes per meeting. Also otherwise permitted by Council Ordinance 91-25. Is there anyone here this evening who would like to address the uh, city? And if so, please come forward, step up to the podium, state your name, address for the record, and use the microphone, please. Is there a microphone up there? Yep. Oh, I couldn't oh, yeah. see the microphone. microphone was hiding against the screen. I got a big mouth, you know that. Yeah, but we need to be able to record it. Yeah, I do it. All right, thank you. Uh, my name's Winifred Weiser, 2177 Jackson Boulevard. I haven't had to do this in a while, and I hoped I didn't have to do it. Um, the Mayor's State of the City address has generated a lot of emotion and response. Two days ago, someone took to Facebook to publicly attempt to shame the mayor with issues that he had to confront and overcome in his past. They did it in a deceitful manner behind a pseudonym. That person's attempt to smear him needs to be condemned. The mayor's response was clear and highly appropriate in that forum, and it was met with response from our citizens. The attempt, quite frankly, failed as it should have. I knew about the items posted when I supported Michael for mayor. I believe the challenges he worked through would help him understand what many of our residents face on a daily basis. His vision included helping those who could face the same difficulties that he had faced in his past. However, I too had issues with the state of the city, but they're very different than the anonymous poster and I have no problem naming and claiming ownership of them. My issue is that one statement in that entire address has the potential to jeopardize the ability of the city to move forward, or it can slow its progress. The state of the city should have been a victory lap, not only for the mayor, but for all of our elected officials. The mayor alone cannot change things without the support and concurrence of our council members. Our charter puts the mayor in charge of administration. However, it gives the power of the purse, the approval of the budget to the council. That is done to keep a balance and to ensure that the vision that gets implemented is the vision that our city can afford. That takes compromise. Over the past two years, this council gave the mayor their support and permission to use part of the monetary reserves to provide the jumpstart for the city. That was done with the understanding that the budget would need to be brought into balance soon. This year, the council is requiring that. That is their right, and a right we, the residents, have given them to perform. They agreed to a vision, they supported getting it there, but also recognized we need to have one vision we can afford. The mayor in the state of the city made the statement he did not support gutting the safety forces, raising the in income tax, or eliminating the tax credit. Because these were mentioned, some residents took these as the only alternatives to his idea of a loan for $1 million to balance the budget. In essence, using debt to balance. Because he said he was against those things, some residents took this as something the council might do, and that is wrong. Council felt that a balanced budget could be achieved without jeopardizing continued growth or doing any of that. But because the inference was there, council was made out to be bad, whether intended or not. I would hope that wasn't what the mayor intended. We are all human. We all make mistakes. No matter if we're a mayor, a council person, appointee, or just a resident, we all make mistakes. We are human in how we react when we feel we are attacked or unjustly accused of something. And we tend to dig in our heels when we feel the other has incorrectly interpreted what was said. We had moved past the mayor council stalemates of the past that held the city back. For two years, compromise and respectful working together occurred. I fear we now might be headed back to the bad old days, and I would hate to see that happen. 
So I'm here tonight to call on you, Mayor, to address any negative feelings generated by your statement. I'm hoping you will recognize that a number of members of council feel ill-treated and were ill-treated in the past, not by you, but because of that treatment, there's a lot of sensitivity that remains. It's time for the eight of you, the seven council members and the mayor, to get back to working on the city's business, to continue the groundwork of compromise that showed such promise over the past two years. Give respect to what we, the residents, through the charter, have, have tasked each of you to do. Administration needs to be willing to compromise with budget authority of the council, and council needs to be willing to compromise also with the administration to ensure the city continues on the positive growth of the past two years. I will also say this. I never say something without telling somebody to their face. The mayor and I had a very good chat this afternoon. Um, and he knew I, would, I have some complaints. He's heard them personally. So it is nothing against the mayor, against any council person. But please, we don't need to go back. We need to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wood. And in response, I will. Uh, I have some things I'm going to say during the mayor's report, so I'm just going to wait till then rather than address you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Can I respond to your as well? Yes, please. You're just um, given the opportunity to condemn the action that you described, I wanted to publicly do that tonight because I think the spirit of what you've said is that you want to maintain and to grow um, a tradition of being able to communicate with one another. And certainly what happened against uh, you online wasn't fair, it wasn't right, and uh, given the opportunity for this president to, to respond to that and to take And thank you. And Councilman Gould, I, I did see your comments to that post before you disappeared from social media. I appreciate what you said there as well. Is there anybody else who would care to address the city this evening? I see Mr. Out in the back room. If you could uh, come to the podium, please. Good evening. My name is Jim Outman. I live at 3781 Westwood Road. I had no intention of standing up here, but when I was listening to the previous citizens' comments, I really wasn't clear in my own mind what she was talking about exactly. But I have had a number of postings on the community Facebook page pertaining to the budget. So I wanted to be clear that one of the comments that I made had to do with quoting the Mayor's State of the City address in which he said, and I don't have it actually with me, I'm sorry to say, but in effect, he said, well, I'm proposing a million dollar loan, and there's four choices. We can raise the income tax rate, we can cut the income tax credit, we can gut the public safety forces, basically by which he meant uh, not purchase vehicles, or we can take out the loan. He described it as the world's easiest multiple choice quiz. That struck me as sort of laying down a gauntlet. Here are your choices, you know, forget about all the other spending out there. Forget about the fact that one third of the loan was intended to go to road maintenance or street maintenance. Um, so I think that, some, that, that I agree with Ms. Weiser that the, we have to be careful with our words. We have to be careful with the tone of our words and understanding that sometimes our meaning or even our intention is not clearly conveyed between thought and written word. So I'm, I'm just sort of echoing what Ms. Weiser said, but I'm also hoping that she wasn't implying from various conversations or statements that she didn't specify. I hope I'm not guilty of contributing to any ill feeling. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who care to address the city this evening? Okay. 
All right, then uh, moving on uh, the agenda, the next item is reports and communications from the mayor and the taking of action. The state of the city was last week, and I want to address what I was going to call the elephant in the room, but it's uh, made its way up to the podium twice. Overall, I stand by what I said, the progress we've made together, the plans that are underway and going forward. There are things that I said that were hurtful or offensive to at least some members of this council, and that was not intended. But my intent is of little or no consequence. Some background. Dennis Kennedy and I worked to propose what we thought was the best budget for 2020. We trimmed away hundreds of thousands of dollars from the original asks made by our departments. We left out projects that matter to the city, such as the facilities review and request for proposals for new municipal facilities that our University Heights Municipal Future be presented on and recommended over a year ago. We left out, again, a much needed garbage truck, but decided to withhold that again, pending the outcome of our solid waste study and any changes we might make to our rubbish and recycling program. What remained were the roads program, and the final remaining capital expenditures, fire turnout gear, and in air packs, all equipment that expires this year and must be replaced. Four new police cars, two new fire prevention vehicles, a dump truck, two new Kubotas for the service department. Our finance director, understanding the parameters that council and I wanted in this budget, that we wanted a balanced budget, and not dip into reserves, and not dip into investments, suggested that we take out a short-term note to make up the difference. And when he said that, I dismissed it out of hand. But he asked me to hear him out. Right now, municipalities can borrow money at a rate of 1.6%. That is less than what we're earning on the money we have on the bank in the bank right now. That is certainly less than what the city's investments are earning. The amount we borrow could be substantially paid off with funds that will become available over the next three years. Other neighboring municipalities have done this or are doing this anywhere from a million to 5.5 million. And we could do this for just under a million. We would be in the position to have these things now rather than do without. And when it comes to vehicles, most of us in our everyday lives don't pay cash to purchase vehicles anyway. We finance them and this is that. So, after rejecting it out of hand, I thought it over, and I warmed up to the idea. Why force ourselves to do without, or dip into money making more in interest, having more return, than this financing would cost us? When administration proposed it, to the finance committee, I forgot to take into account my own visceral reaction to borrowing money. And at our first finance meeting on the budget, I think it's fair to say that some reacted as I initially. And that was the day before I delivered the state of the city. So I went home and I reread that section. And my intention was to provide cover, to lead on the issue. I know our community is not used to the idea of borrowing money, especially when we have reserves and we have investments. It's an unusual ask. It's a tough ask. And I, and I felt that I owed it to you to put my name on the line of To not leave it to this council to make the tough decision. So when I said there were four choices before us, and that three of them were to raise taxes, reduce the tax credit, or gut our safety services, I did not mean to imply that our members of council somehow were in favor of any of those things. Nevertheless, I said those words that left that impression among some, including, I understand, some of us who were up here on, on the days. And while offense was not intended, that is immaterial when offense was nevertheless received. So for that, I am sorry. I apologize to each and every one of our council members, whether you were offended or not. And most of all, 
I apologize to our vice mayor. No sooner are you the vice mayor that something I know you've been looking forward to having the opportunity to do it for some time. That this mayor is jamming you up, putting you out, and placing you in this difficult position. That is no way for us to start what I had fully expected and intend and still intend to be a fruitful relationship working together, Mr. Harris. So, Michelle, I am sorry. Historically, I have enjoyed a harmonious, collaborative relationship with our council, and I hope this can continue. Late this afternoon, Mr. Kennedy sent out a revised budget. The bridge loan is still there, but we have reduced it by more than a third, and I'm hopeful that at Thursday's finance meeting, that we can discuss it. Since the State of the City and our special council meeting to appoint and install Sandra Berry as our newest member of council, I've done only a few things besides meet on the budget. I attended the Northeastern Ohio Mayors and Managers meeting and was briefed on coronavirus. I represented our city at the NMRSD Council of Governments. I participated in the NOAC Finance and Audit Committee meeting, of which I am now the committee's vice chair. I attended the County Planning Commission meeting representing all of the Heights. And among the business, uh, we went over the ongoing effort for a complete count of our region and of our city in the upcoming census. Now, Mike Cook is gonna go into this somewhat more tonight, somewhat more after tonight, but it is imperative that we get everyone counted who is living here in the city as of April 1st. That includes all of our student neighbors who live off campus. We must make sure they self-report here. To be clear, even if a student in a rental on Warrensville Center Road is from, say, Rochester, New York, registers her car there, votes there, her parents still live there, the Census Bureau says she is to report herself as here in University Heights. And we need to make a strong effort that they all report, that everyone reports themselves for the census count, in this case for the students, before they leave town for final, after finals. The problem is, if they don't respond to notices, census takers probably won't knock on their doors until they've already left for the summer. And we have to get them counted in April. So that means all hands on deck. <coughs> Every one of us up here has gone door to door for our campaigns or for other causes. And I respectfully suggest that this would be one of those times that we all put our schools doing that. Every person who doesn't get counted by at least one study costs us $19,500 in federal funding over the next 10 years that we could have had. I don't want to miss anyone here at University Heights. We don't want to wait another 10 years to try again. I wanted to wait until the Tech Advisory Commission was a panel and could meet before making a decision on IT. Unfortunately, I must report that the actions of our last IT contractor put us in a position where I had no choice but to terminate their services. I have brought in Bailey Communications, who had a quote in for a review already on the interim basis. Tech Advisory should still meet, of course, and either uh, recommend the continued use of Bailey or recommend the other vendor that uh, I provided to Councilwoman Sue Hardy. Um, the third quote that I provided was from the vendor I had to fire. Or make such other recommendations they deem appropriate. I know we'll be making appointments to the Tech Advisory Commission this evening, and I do urge that the Commission be at the next available date. Finally, this is our last meeting with Patrick Rogan Myers as our Housing and Community Development Director. From the start, as an intern from JCU under the previous administration, through today, many of the best things we've done as a city over the last few years and certainly the last two years were done, at least in part, often in substantial part, by the efforts of Patrick Grogan Myers. While I long knew this day would come, it is nevertheless bittersweet to see him do it. I, of course, wish you, Patrick, great success in your new role as Economic Development Director for the City of Maple Heights. Thank you. This concludes my report. Next item on the agenda 
are the announcement of appointments to council standing committees. Vice Mayor Weiss, did you want to uh, pick for him? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So in light of our new council member, Mrs. Sandra Berry, um, we had to make some adjustments with the council committees. There's going to be two changes, um, one to safety and one to economic development. So the new safety head will be um, Sandra Berry. The economic development head will now be John Rock. And just in terms of committee members and alternates, um, Mrs. Berry will now be a member of the finance committee and an alternate on the building and housing committee. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. <coughs> Any discussion necessary at this juncture on this agenda item? Well, congratulations to Mrs. Barry on her appointment as head of the safety committee. And thank you for your service, Mr. Rock, on the safety committee. And your congratulations on your appointment to that appointment. Next uh, is the appointment of Susan Hartley and Justin Cole to the CIC. Most of you aware that uh, the community has a community improvement corporation called the University of City. Beautiful community improvement corporation. Uh, by the bylaws, uh, the vice mayor is a member. The council it has uh, a couple of appointed members. And just by operation of changes that have happened with the council uh, with the new year, we now have a new vice mayor, uh, one of the other council appointees was the now vice mayor, and then the other one was Councilman Weisman, who is uh, no longer on the city council either. So um, there is, uh, I believe, I understand it's council's intention to appoint uh, to the two council seats on the CIC, the council members, uh, Susan Hardy and Justin Cooper. So I understand that to be so. Is there a motion to so appoint? So moved, Motion by Mrs. Weiss. Is there a second? Yeah. Second by Mrs. Berry. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Mrs. Thomas, will you call the roll? Mrs. Wendell? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Okay, yeah. motion carries. Mrs. Hardy and Justin Gould are so from CIC. Next item is A2 uh, appointment of members to the Technology Advisory Commission. here this evening. Uh, I do have some names that have been put forward for uh, appointment. Uh, they include uh, to the to, rather to the uh, to the Technology Advisory Commission. Uh, those include uh, Andrew Brow, who is a resident here in the city. Uh, some of you on council will recall Mr. Brow from the council uh, uh, appointment process that we just uh, underwent. I also know Mr. Brow and, and know that he would uh, have something of value to contribute to this commission. Uh, we have uh, Stephen DeLott as well. I think I may have seen Stephen uh, on this, this evening. Are you here? Oh, okay. Sorry. I need to know. I need to know. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so Stephen DeLott has also uh, uh, been put forward, and um, Mrs. Barty recommends uh, his appointment. Well, I've also had a chance to work with Stephen in other capacities. I would be happy to see him there. Um, Christine Hudak uh, also has put herself forward for uh, inclusion on tech advisory. I understand that in conjunction with her work at uh, Kent State University that she does uh, serves in a similar capacity there among her many uh, duties at Kent and could serve our city well in that same regard. And finally, um, I'm afraid my Chinese is not as good as I wish it were. Um, um, so it's John Kwong uh, has uh, also uh, been nominated for the Tech Advisory Committee. I don't know if he's here this evening. Oh yeah, there you are. I'm sorry, how do you see 
Jiang Chen. Thank you. Jiang Chen. Jiang Chen, right? Is that right? Yeah. Oh, very good. Thank you. So, uh, those of our appointees who are here this evening, if you could just stand up, you know, for our council. Let's see, John. And, okay. Okay. Good. All right. All right. Great. Well, then, um, um, I believe the action that's to be taken here is that the, I'm sorry, the mayor makes this appointment, but then council approves it. Does that, does that sound right to me, Mr. Water? Uh, I'm not sure. Members shall be appointed by the mayor with the approval of the Civic Information Committee from those submitted by members of council. Do we still have a Civic Information And I, I would suggest that in the absence of one uh, committee of the whole, which would be the council members up here, could somebody make it? The, 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 we think that'd be all right. Mm -hmm. yes. all right well, then, um, uh, I'm happy that as mayor to appoint Jiang uh, Chen, Andrew Drow. Christine Hudak and Stephen Delot uh, to the Technology Advisory Commission. And they are so by appointed, and then if a uh, member of council would care to make a motion to appoint, to confirm any one or all four of those appointees, uh, I would entertain such a motion at this time. So moved. For all four? For all four. So we have a motion by uh, Mr. Gould to approve all four appointments. Is there a second? A second one. Very good. Second by Mrs. Blankfield. Any discussion? Saying none, Mrs. Thomas, we call the vote. Mrs. Blankfield? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Bob? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Very, very good. Well, congratulations to our appointees, and uh, I hope we'll be calling the meeting soon for uh, several reasons, including the reason I stated earlier this evening in the mayor's report. Uh, thank you. Okay, then finally, uh, under appointments, we have the appointment of Matthew Califf to the Board of Zoning Appeals Commission. Mr. Califf, you're here? Yes, there he is. Uh, Mr. Califf, uh, many of you on council will also be familiar with Mr. Califf uh, because he too went through the uh, recent uh, process for consideration for our, our council seat. Uh, he, he has a, a, an excellent resume uh, and a wealth of experience. He attended our last BZA meeting as an observer and, and, and got a taste of some of the work that we do there, and in spite of that, he is still here. <laughs> and, and, and I'm delighted uh, at, at Vice Mayor Weiss's suggestion to, to appoint him to the seat that has been uh, vacated by Harvey Chavez. So Mr. Chavez is a 30-year resident here at the City of the University of Ice, but no sooner because he spent a year or so on the Board of Zoning Appeals that he saw fit to leave town. So he is moving to Beachwood. Uh, and, and we all wish him very well, of course. Uh, Ms. Harvey. But I'm delighted to uh, to recommend the appointment of, of Matthew Cale to Board of Zoning Appeals uh, under our updated ordinance uh, on, on the BZA. Um, uh, some may recall that it used to be that the mayor chaired the BZA and got a vote at that level, and then appeals from the BZA came to the council. And a couple of years ago, we made a decision to depoliticize the BZA removing the mayor from the Board of Zone Appeals itself. Now I just sit in the gallery with the rest of the peanuts. And, uh, and, and we eliminated also the appeal to council to make it a less political process. You go to the BZA, you get your decision or you do not, and if you do not get the outcome, your choice then is to appeal to the Court of Common Appeals, which is a much more straightforward process and better good government measure takes the politics right now. So. All right, all right. So. That all said, uh, uh, this is a, an unexpired term that would end this coming January 2021. So I, I would ask for a motion to appoint Matthew Caleb to the Board of Zoning Appeals Commission uh, 
for the unexpired term, which ends in January 2021. Is there such a motion? So moved. Second. Very good. We have a motion by Mrs. Weiss, a second by Mr. Rock. Is there any discussion? Mr. Caleb, is there anything you'd like to say? No, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to it. Okay. Very good. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Caleb? Okay. Then, uh, if there's no further, if there's no further uh, discussion, Mrs. Thomas, will you call the roll? Mrs. Michael? Aye. Mrs. Gary? Aye. Mr. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Very good. Very good. Um, Mr. Bale, if we come up front, I, I will swear you in. If you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. Um, I, Matthew Caleb, I'm Matthew Caleb, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm to support the Constitution, support the Constitution and, laws and laws of the United States of America. The, United States of America. the Constitution. And laws, and laws of the state of Ohio, of the state of Ohio, and the charter, and the charter, and ordinances, and ordinances of the city of University Heights, University Heights, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, as a member, as a member of the city of University Heights, of the city of University Heights, Board of Zoning Appeals. Board of Zoning Appeals. So let me know. Congratulations, sir. Before we proceed to the next item on the agenda, uh, make council aware of a grant that we received uh, notification of, of, of winning today. And uh, per the terms of the grant, they want us to accept the grant before the deadline is before the next council. So while this is a late ad, I would move from the floor or ask someone to make the motion from the floor to to add to the agenda either next or you know, perhaps at, at, at the last item on the agenda so we don't have to remember everything. Um, motion to accept the uh, 2020 Community Recycling Awareness Grant in the amount of $6,000 for the City of University Heights for the purpose of implementing um, certain activities that were described in the City's 2020 grant application. Is there a motion to add that item to the agenda as item We'll just say I'm okay and then Bob advocate it. I don't know. So motion by Mr. Rock. Is there second. a second? Second by Mrs. Black. Uh, is there any discussion? Seeing none, Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Blessel? Aye. Mr. Leary? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Dewell? Aye. Very good. That item has been added as item K. Motion will exact session now item L on the agenda. And now we will proceed to item B on the agenda, which is Ordinance 2020 09, rezoning certain parcels located on Lawrenceville South Road. Permanent parcel number is 722 10 028 and 722 10 048 from Automobile Parking District U3 to Local Retail District or U7. This is on first reading, just by way of uh, housekeeping. Uh, C, items C, D, and E are all uh, similar to item B, uh, and, and, and Mrs. Trucker, our economic development director, is going to speak on, on all four of these items, but we'll start with, with B. So, Mrs. Trucker, you before. Thank you, Mayor and Council. As the Mayor stated, items B through E, um, I will be um, asking for a referral to planning as these are all on first reading. Um, and in addition, on all of these items, all of the property owners of, of each of these items have been notified. They were all notified through letter that was mailed out on February 3rd. 
Uh, so begin with the first one. This is um, an ordinance to rezone uh, um, permanent parcel number 722-10-028, which is currently zoned automobile parking district, which is U3. What we're doing here is continuing. Um, we've been cleaning up the zoning map and in the process eliminating the U3 where it was unnecessary. Um, and then, and this is one of the cases. And then also in permanent parcel number 722-01-048, that is also zoned automobile parking uh, U3. And here we are requesting to rezone these two parcel numbers to local retail district U7, which would match the current use on that site. Uh, to each piece of legislation, I did um, uh, add the letters that were sent to the, uh, pro to the property owner and every property owner understood that this was a proactive measure and th that this new zoning designation would not um, affect the current uses that were on the site um, today. So this is just a housekeeping issue that will assist in helping um, the city clarify our zoning map. And then I also attached the map, if you um, look at the map for, that's attached to this piece of legislation, what you're looking at is the parcel is, uh, the two parcels are located north of Silsby, on the west side of Warrensville Center Road, you see 722-10028, and then just north of that, there's a box. The box does not have a parcel number in there. That is parcel number 722-01-048. So this is a parking lot that runs behind the four, four pars permanent parcel numbers that face Warrensville Center Road. That's Flowerville, Geraces, and where Cut Above is located. So. Um, we are just looking for the two that are behind the four that face Warrensville Center Road to make those rezone those as U7. So that whole corner would be U7, which is local retail district. Any questions on that one? Very good. Any questions for Mrs. Scott? Mr. Gould. When the current buildings that are on these parcels were built, was Coded as a U3? Correct. Those, so U3 was um, treated as a buffer zone. It's, it was for parking. But we really, our, our code covers for that if we were, if someone were to have retail and then we have some sort of screening. So the U3 we wanted to, that's really not a use because it's not just a parking lot at a zone. That's a parking lot that's serving the primary use, which is the local retail district. <coughs> so that's why we wanted to just make it all U7. So as I get better acclimated with these kind of group, how, how was something able to be built on a U3 if it didn't meet that purpose? Um, I, there's, I, I, don't, I can't explain why some of these lots were designated U3. What you'll also find, I'm going to um, actually in the next one, there's going to be one parcel number that has two zonings on it, U3 and U7. So I don't know, I can't explain what may or may not have happened through the years and if something was not clarified on the map. But when, when we're looking at the zoning map, when we identify these irregularities, if you will, we just, this is a process to clean them up. So I don't know why that one, one parcel would have two zonings on it, which you can't have. Um, so what we looked at was this U3 was the easiest, kind of the low-hanging fruit on the zoning map right now to clean that up. Um, so once we're done with, there, there will, after today, if all four of these are referred to planning and then ultimately uh, the U3s are rezoned to U7s, on our zoning map we will only have two um, parcels that will be zoned U3. One is the parking lot that is actually a parking lot at John Carroll University for the students. And then the other one um, will be the parking that is that uh, the U3 that's the parking right behind the McDonald's. And we were doing some research on that site um, because of when that when McDonald's was built, we're, we're discovering it never was consolidated. So that that's something I'll be taking care of separately. Um, so, in fact, I forwarded Luke the mayor, and, uh, Luke and the mayor, um, that information today based on some old planning events. So, unfortunately, I can't answer why these are, were zoned the way they were. I just am here to clean them up today and make sure we establish a record for how these uh, parcels are zoned and why we're zoning them that way. Yeah, and just to provide a little additional context, um, the question that you're asking is really the question. Um, that we've been asking internally that's generated this review of the zoning map and then caused uh, parcels such as the ones in front of you today to 
um, be reviewed and, and put before council with, with um, what we hope will be a referral to the planning commission um, so that we have consistency um, between parcels um, that um, will allow us to, to, I think, do some more effective planning going forward. We literally have um, buildings, commercial buildings located within the city that are split between zoning districts. And if um, new businesses move in, it, it creates a whole host of potential <coughs> problems if there's reason to deny uh, building permits uh, or if there's some other kind of problem. So we are seeking to um, create certainty for the city in terms of legal analysis and the plan that comes before us as we go forward. And that's really uh, the, the main impetus for um, the review that, that uh, Mrs. Drucker and Patrick Rubin Myers have conducted um, relative to our zone. I just want to make sure that there is some type of process that's in place so that in the future when we the argument is renounced to our, our zoning code. That the building process should involve making sure that the lot is appropriate for what's being asked to be built. So at some point, someone came along and said, I want to put this business on this U3 zone. And then someone issued, well, presumably these were issued permits, someone issued permits to allow a structure to be built. And those permits were issued without a process that checked to ensure that the structure on which they, you know, that the land that on, on which the structure was built were appropriate for that purpose. So I just want to make sure that that process has been implemented now so that we do that. Okay, okay. okay. And, and we have a, a project that's going on right now. Um, it's the John Carroll Tennis Court project um, that was recently approved where um, the parcels um, on which the expansion of the tennis court facility um, are going, is going to extend, those parcels were rezoned um, so that all of the contiguous parcels um, on which the tennis courts will be situated have the same zoning. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we, we can only, we only be guessing as to what the rationale was behind doing what was done historically. Uh, we don't have the historic record as to why, <coughs> what motivated doing building on, on across different zoning and, and allowing it to occur. Uh, but, but we are you know, hopeful of doing a comprehensive zoning update and, and, the, and cleaning up these sort of things now before we engage uh, someone for doing that. It, you know, these are things that we can clean up and give them a, a better starting point. So, Mrs. Drucker has endeavored uh, to, to uh, find, locate some of these and shepherd through getting these uh, cleaned up for us. Okay. Just to, to add to that, this is a perfect example of why for the last two years we really wanted to put um, in place you know, a mechanism where we can, where we can actually you know, put RFPs out and actually get a um, company in to do this. Because we keep coming up, you know, I think this is. <laughs> it's it's not, these four do not end it. We have, right, I mean, they're yeah. yeah. coming back until right. we have that update zoning code. Every time, as Luke mm -hmm. was saying, when a business moves in, when we have a, one parcel or, or a, um, a, a several buildings, but the buildings split in half with two different zonings, that has two different sets of requirements. So it can affect parking requirements, uh, uses what have you. And so it, it does, it's, it's a mess. So as these issues were coming up, and then we started looking at the map, that's why we just wanted to start. We wanted to attack the things that we could take care of that wouldn't negatively affect or impact if we did get a comprehensive zoning code, it wouldn't, it wouldn't impact that work. This would be just they would include this part. This isn't something that they, somebody uh, somebody would look at and say, ah, you know what, that was done wrong. This is cleaning that up. It's one. It's eliminating one problem that we have. The changes, I think, are, are meant to, um, you know, first of all, not adversely impact current owners. <coughs> um, and secondly, to provide a more um, development-friendly environment mm -hmm. for anyone who might be looking at a particular piece of property or a particular use. that's been made here with respect to the parcels that are before us as well as other parcels that may be coming 
to let those business owners know that none of what we're doing here is intended to interfere with their operations. That what we're doing is cleaning up, um, cleaning up our side of things, um, so that in the future there is less confusion. You know, should they ever want to redevelop, should somebody else come in in their place? And so on. All right. So item B has had its first reading. Um, I suppose we should read C, D, and E. Well, before we do that, I think we'll, um, just just as a, a reminder to council members and also for the benefit of the um, general public, our zoning process requires referral to planning commission. Uh, for planning commission to conduct a public hearing, um, the property owners will also get notice of that public hearing. Uh, planning commission makes a recommendation with respect to the ordinance. That recommendation comes back to council, it is not binding on council, but whether you implement the recommendation or not um, may, may have a number of votes that are required to buck the planning commission, if you will, yes. is different from the number required to accept the recommendation, but um, it will ultimately come back to you for final approval. So at this point, we would be asking council to refer um, the ordinance to the planning commission all right, is there a motion then with respect to item, e, or item B to uh, refer uh, ordinance 2020 09 to the Planning Commission? So moved. Okay, motion by Mrs. Blankville. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Thomas. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Mrs. Thomas, we call. Mrs. Blankville? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Rod? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Aye. Very good. Uh, item B, ordinance 2020 09, is hereby referred. To the planning commission. So we now move to item C, ordinance 2020-10, rezoning a certain parcel located on John Carroll Boulevard as follows. Permanent parcel number 721-06-008, from U7 and U3 to local retail district or U7. This is on first reading. Mrs. Strucker, anything you wanted to add with respect to this particular item? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is a John Carroll property that was uh, consolidated from two parcels to one. It's also that the whole lot was split, so half was is University Heights, the other half is Shaker Heights. So this is one particular parcel that has two zonings currently attached to it, U7 and U3. So if you look on the map um, that I attached to that, you'll see the uh, boundary line going right through the middle of the building. This is where um, where the parcel number 7210608 You'll, that corner, that's where Pizzazz is, just so you have a frame of reference. So that parking lot um, is uh, also um, to serve the primary use of that retail district. So we wanted to rezone that to just U7 and eliminate the, the, the U3. I've always wondered what part of that, the University Heights and what part of the Well, in, in that building alone, it's so, the easiest way is from Pizzazz down to what was formerly the Sweet Melissa's. But just so everyone knows, the Sweet Melissa's, the city only has jurisdiction over the sign, and everything else goes to Shaker Heights. So it's something we've been trying to work with Shaker Heights of maybe just trying to our opticians the yeah, front of their building is the University at, Heights, the rear of their building is Shaker. Right. And then on the second floor, half the businesses right. are in the other, you know, so it's really it's unique. It's a unique situation. So this is just one step in addressing issues over there because we have been in contact with um, Shaker Heights about possibly splitting. So for so when the new business owner that's taking over the Sweet Melissa space, they had to go to both cities for their planning because they had to come to us for our, for the signage, and then they're going to Shaker Heights for the rest of the, the, the interior build out of. And, and then if they wanted to use the patio. So it's really, that is not business friendly. So um, so yeah, we'll be looking at that building. On that second floor, mm -hmm. some of them say they're in shape Correct. Some of them say they're in shape Correct. correct. Yes. yes. That's and correct. The funny thing with Sweet Melissa's always advertises their University Heights location. And then really once you're in the building, you see that you're no longer in the University Heights. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same thing with the House of Alice. On a positive note, I had a conversation with new owners of the Picnic Hill 
the sort of they tried to get into University Heights and every one of the business locations they tried to get into was already spoken for. Yeah. So that's a, yeah that's well, and, and actually the um, mm -hmm. the Big B's that just opened, he the that owner actually has a business in University Heights. So we I was showing him some spaces, the silver, sometime last year. So he called me up, he's excited, he goes, I found a space in University Heights. I'm like, great, where? And he told me, I'm like, that's not University Heights. <laughs> so, um, but, um, but he's still interested in bringing a big B into University Heights, actually. And I can tell you, Mike Cook has been single-handedly yep. keeping him in business. <laughs> All right, so is there a motion? Did you have everything? Is that no, that was all on this, on this uh, person. Okay, is there a motion then to refer agenda item C to the Planning Commission? So moved. Okay, very good. Motion by Mrs. Blankfeld. Is there a second? Second. Second by mm -hmm. Mrs. Berry. Any discussion? Seeing that Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Blankfeld? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. White? Aye. Mr. Rudd? Aye. Mr. Blue? Aye. Okay, very good. Uh, item C is. Uh, is now referred to the Planning Commission. That takes us to item D, Ordinance 2020-11, rezoning certain parcels located on Warrensville Center Road, permanent parcel number 721-02-027 and 721-02-028 from Automobile Parking District U3 to Local Retail District or U7. This is on first reading. This is Drucker. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is, um, has to do with the two parcels that are, at the, um, that are behind the Silsby Center. And that is um, runs from Bialy's down to Rascal House. So we have two parcel numbers. These two permanent parcel numbers are currently zoned uh, U3. We want to, I'm asking that for those to be rezoned to U7. If you look on the map, um, right behind, the, it, it's um, north of Silsby Road on the east side of Warrensville Center Road. Um, you, again, this is one of those where you'll only see a little box. So uh, you have 721-02028. And, and then 7210207 is the box that does not have any permanent parcel number listed in it. Um, but that would then be making those U7. Um, and just to take this a step further, this is the, the next step with all of this is once we have things properly zoned, then we're going to have to be addressing with when you have one property owner and all of these types, these lots, consolidating lots under a common ownership. But again, that's something we'll be looking at in the future. We want to first get everything zoned properly and then take that next step ultimately sometime in the future. So um, this is the parking lot that serves the retail located, um, as I said, between uh, Bialy's and Rest House. So we're looking to rezone that to both of those parcels to U7. And that would match the current U7 uh, of the site. Very good. Thank you, Mrs. Drucker. Any questions for Mrs. Drucker? Is there a motion to refer uh, agenda item D to the planning commission? So moved. Very good. Motion by Mrs. Blankfeld. Is there uh, a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Weiss. Any discussion? Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Blankfeld? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Rapp? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Very good. Motion carries, and uh, this matter is referred to the Planning Commission, which leaves one more item E, Ordinance 2020-12, rezoning a certain parcel located on Warrensville Center Road as follows. Permanent parcel number 722-10-023 from U7 and U3 to local retail district or U7. This is on the first reading. This is Dr. Uh, yes, this is the building on Warrensville uh, where Dr. Carper and Gilmore Comprehensive Dental Health Care is, uh, right across the street from um, the Annex. Um, if you look on the map, this is the L shape. This is the one that is south of Bushnell, 722-10-023. You see it's an L shaped lot. So if, if you look earlier, the first item we did was um, the parking behind the, from Flowerville to uh, a cut above. It, this was one that was split, uh, or it was consolidated, but yet the, the U3 zoning remained on it instead of making it all U7. So we want to um, rezone that entire parcel to just two seven. Very good, thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Drucker? If not, is there a motion to refer agenda item E to the Planning Commission? Very good, motion by Mrs. Blanco. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Barry. Any discussion? 
Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Plato? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Wilk? Aye. Very good. Agenda item E is now referred to the Planning Commission. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rock. Next is item F, Ordinance 2020-13, authorizing all actions necessary to accept the Northeastern Ohio Public Energy Council for the 2020 Energized Community Grant. This is on first reading. Mr. Rubemeyer. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. So this is the formal action um, that we undertook similar to last year. Um, NOPEC provides a, a, an amount of funding annually based on uh, its billing, the amount of customers here in the city for the city to be able to provide back to residents cost savings through some sort of energy uh, improvement project. So as you may recall, last year uh, we worked with the police department to be able to get school, uh, new LED school zone signs um, and, and equipment as well as traffic uh, lights and pedestrian crosswalk signals, um, LED bulbs and, and things of that nature that will ultimately deliver cost savings to the residents um, through those fixtures. That was through this same grant program. Uh, so this is the first step in that process that we'll undertake every year. So this is the formal authorization for the mayor to enter into an agreement to accept those funds um, and agree to uh, abide by the terms and conditions of the grant program. When the city has a program, uh, excuse me, a project that is ready to uh, be part of, part of an application, we'll come back to the city uh, council to you and seek your approval to actually submit that application. Like I said, this is just kind of the formal uh, accepting of the grant funds. Uh, unfortunately, I, I made a request of NOPAC to see how much we would be receiving uh, this year as part of the, the grant agreement. Uh, they've not gotten back to me yet. Based on last year's figures, we're looking at about $42,000. Um, so and, and that we can escrow that over uh, to another year if we're looking to do some somewhat larger project. Um, and so I believe we escrowed maybe about $30,000 last year. So there, there's a nice chunk of funds that I'm sure we'll continue to, uh, well after I'm gone, continue to look at how to deliver energy savings to the residents. Thank you, Mr. Rubin-Myers. Any questions for Patrick? No, but I would like to say I'm certainly going to miss Mr. Grogan Myers for all sorts of reasons, but his hard work in getting us grants, sometimes quite substantial for things like this, that will be great. Yeah. And when you say after I'm gone, that's not just not so obvious. <laughs> <laughs> he also he also kept saying we'll come back. Yes. And I'm like, we'll come back. <laughs> yeah. All right. I make guest appearances. All right. yes. Well, you know, I, I participate in the first suburbs consortium. I know I'm going to see. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, any other questions though as, as to the. Uh, Ordinance itself. Well, this is on first reading. There's no reason to require the emergency on this one. So, if there's nothing further, uh, we, the first reading is had, and we will bring it up probably at the uh, next council meeting in March. Just without, oh, you didn't have to leave more. Right? <laughs> 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 Very good. Uh, item G is uh, <laughs> Ordinance 2020 14, uh, enacting codified ordinance section 1620.07 titled Prohibition on Tampering with Fire Protection Systems and Declaring an Emergency. And this is on first reading. Uh, Chief Perko, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Uh, this ordinance is uh, in conjunction with our ongoing safety analysis in the Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, in our collaboration with the law director to strengthen our ordinances and implement best practices in the community. Um, it addresses um, a lot of the systems that have been currently maintained throughout the years and then some of those systems that out of our prevention officers are getting out into the community more, uh, making sure our systems are up and running. Um, sometimes they go off and they're <coughs> false alarms. These situations, um, the tenant may not always know what to do and may reset the alarm uh, or silence it. Uh, the, uh, there's other instances where the alarm go into a trouble mode and where it would not alert us. Uh, so this ordinance covers not only tampering, but silencing the alarm or resetting the alarm. Um, an example of what can happen from this, we, we've had instances where like a multifamily apartment with a high risk 
has had an alarm go into trouble, or the fire department wasn't made aware, or it didn't make its way to a maintenance custodian, and then weeks or months go by where there's no fire protection system in place to automatically alert us to respond. So this will aid us not only with tampering, but to make sure that uh, we're doing best practices and make sure the community's safe. Uh, in the ordinance, you'll recognize that it calls out for the commercial, industry, retail, and multi-residential occupancies. And then it also spells out the different zoning districts. Uh, item uh, subsection C uh, spells out what fire protection systems is, and that is from uh, chapter 1620 in the current ordinance, um, which is partnered with some of the previous ordinances that the law directors assisted us with uh, last year. Very good, thank you, uh, Chief Kirkham. Uh, Mr. Kirkham, anything you want to add to this? Uh, just very briefly to piggyback on what the Chief had to say, we, we um, drafted language in this ordinance to make sure that it's consistent with other defined terms um, throughout this chapter um, so that uh, it's going to be consistent. Um, other than that, I think that the ordinance speaks for itself. It was our intention, because uh, it's declaring an emergency, it was our intention to vote on it this evening and have it go into effect immediately or for this Well, it says first reading. I just want a clarification. So we, we've, we've had our first reading. I believe it's the chief's preference that this be put into place immediately. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't see the downside to that uh, other than reading. That's a, certainly it would allow um, the chief to inspect for on site under this ordinance immediately. It's a, very good. Mr. Mark. We just spoke about moving certain businesses and their buildings from the U3 designation parking lot to the U7 designation, which is covered by this ordinance. How then does that affect our communication to those businesses, that moving designation, their zoning designation, from one to the other has no effect on their business if now they will be subject to additional fire protection? Well, all, all of their buildings are located in one way or another in, in something other than U3. So we have, we have buildings that um, sit in two separate zoning districts that, uh, where one of which is a U3. Um, but they all sit in, in part a district other than the U3. The U3 is designed and meant to be um, a parking district only, so it's essentially meant to be just a parking lot. Um, yeah, I mean, this is so I, I think the city would take the position that they would um, be subject to a district that the that contemplates a building being located on it. But in any event, this is a new regulation. So, um, you know, there are, there are um, commercial buildings throughout the city that don't currently um, have to meet or really be subject to this requirement. It, it doesn't currently exist. I mean, if, 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 if just looking back at the item E, which is the, the, the dentist, which, uh, the dentistry building, and then, particular dental practice, uh, uh, it, it presently straddles outside of U3, and, and they're subject to rules that go to U7. This unifies that U7 really does truly apply to the entire building. I, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody is taking the view in any of the parcels where there are split zoning that if you're standing on this side of the building, one side of the building is fine, if you're standing on the other side of the building or even the other side of the same office that they don't it, but it's a matter of, of avoiding that kind of thing. And, and I think you would find that, that um, in, in every other respect, they're following the, the, the zoning that's the non-parking lot portion of the zoning or other aspects of their business use. Okay. 
Well, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to get it out. There may be, uh, uh, Chief, how, how would you plan to let people know? With the fire, the fire uh, systems, perhaps we could sticker the new ordinance or something? Most, most of the fire um, prevention bureaus in the area do sticker them, and then they reference the uh, ordinance on the sticker. It goes on the fire alarm panel itself. To be clear, it's a violation of tamper. And to, and to be clear for the record, so this specific ordinance only addresses tampering with a system that is currently in place or be, would be required to be in place for some other reason, whether it be a new build out or a different use. So to your point, um, if there's no system in place there, then it's not going to require them to put one in right now because of this specific ordinance. It would just reference that they couldn't tamper with the one that's currently in place. And we would sticker that some of the previous ordinance changes we have done, we have rolled out letters to the business owners to let them know what was going on. We can look into doing the same thing for this. Very good thing, Mrs. White. Thank you, Chief. Now that you brought up um, some businesses don't have panels, do you know like, what percentage of our commercial has or does not have? I don't know that I could give you an accurate number. Really? Of the tenants, not the buildings. But all the buildings, like all of the, um, there's a stretch of stores that building would have a panel, but maybe not the individual. It's mixed throughout the city. Really? And then like, as this references a uh, fire protection system, it's not just the fire alarm panel. That could be a, a cooking suppression system, sprinkler, any, any type of Does anybody else have anything for Chief Perko? Any further question or comment on the proposed ordinance? Is there a motion? So, so this yeah. would be a motion to adopt on emergency. On emergency, please. Okay, very. So we have a motion to adopt on emergency by Mr. Brock, and do we have a second? Is that Mrs. Bunkfield or Mrs. Berry? I thought I heard a second one. Second. Second best. Very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Well, for the benefit. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, for the benefit of our new council members, there will be two votes. Uh, first, a, a, a vote to suspend the rules to allow for the uh, consideration uh, on emergency, so that this could be uh, immediately. Uh, and then a vote on the motion itself, uh, both of which will require not a vote of four, but a vote of five. Correct. Great. All right. Well, then, if there's no further discussion, Mrs. Thomas, will you call the roll first on the suspension of the rules? Mrs. Blankville? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Buck? Aye. Mr. Blue? Aye. Okay. And then a roll call on the main motion. Mrs. Glenfield? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Woods? Aye. Mr. Rudd? Aye. Mr. Bill? Aye. Okay, very good. Uh, ordinance 2020-13 passes and will become law upon presentation and signature by the mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief for your work on this. Thank you, Mr. Bill. All right. Next up is uh, item H. Uh, motion approving finance director Dennis Kennedy and deputy finance director Rita Drew as delegate and alternate delegate to the Regional Income Tax Authority Regional Council of Governments. Mr. Kennedy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. This is just an annual update to uh, the Council of Governments established by Rita. Um, and this will give me the ability to participate in decisions and votes that relate to the read organization itself on behalf of the other students. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Any questions on this matter? There are none. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Second. Motion by Mrs. West to approve. Is there a second? Second. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. 
second notice is carried. All right. Uh, any discussion? Seeing that Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Benfield? Aye. Mrs. Bean? Aye. Mrs. Was? Aye. Mr. Dubois? Aye. Mr. Gold? Aye. Very good. Motion approved. Next is item I, authorizing the mayor to advertise for bids for the 2020 Grass Nuisance Abatement Program. Uh, Mr. Kirby Myers, you may take the Thank you, Mayor. So um, this is uh, to solicit bids for the contractor who will go out and cut grass for residents who do not comply with the yellow tag type of grass. So that's when your grass grows too tall or you have weeds in the property. Um, so, so this is, uh, we're getting a, we're jumping uh, on this a little bit sooner than we did last year um, and trying to get some more about getting competitive bids and, and you know, as we lead into the the season. So, uh, while I'm up here tonight, we're crossing this on behalf of the Housing and Community Development Department. Uh, moving forward, at least um, for the time being, uh, the service director will be handling uh, this, uh, both uh, just because it seems to be the most logical place, but also uh, in conformance with uh, Chapter 1084.04, which uh, has the service director taken care of this. So the Housing Department will continue to tag properties as it has in the past um, and working with the service director. Uh, work to get those addresses over to the grass contractor in the future should they need to have Thank you. We had an issue last year, right, with our contractor. Did any of that get resolved? So, so there were um, kind of several moving parts to that issue. Um, the first was with the timing of the creation of the Housing and Community Development Department. We didn't go out to bid until later, uh, just at the start of the growth season. So that posed a timing challenge uh, that we ended up resolving just by getting the grass contractor in place. Um, part of what we were also implementing was a newer system, something that required the contractor to uh, provide us pictures electronically um, as part of the invoicing. So I believe that we've smoothed out a lot of the issues that we were struggling with last year. So it wasn't actually the contractor, it was just the process at Kingston. I thought we had, he wasn't, the, company, or the, not he, the company wasn't. So there, there was a, a stopgap contractor while we were bidding out, um, and, and that was where we were having issues issue. with the contractor, but it was, it was intended as a stopgap. Once we got the, the actual contract in place, once you approved the bid, um, that's when everything kind of got on all fours and was able to work out. Any other questions about uh, this agenda? Is there a motion to authorize the mayor to advertise for bids for this program? So, very good. Motion by Mr. Gould. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Holmes. I can't wait to do this. <laughs> for reasons I'm not going to get into this. <laughs> <laughs> I have plenty of other times. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, is there any discussion on this matter? Seeing none. Uh, uh, Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Mrs. Blanco? Aye. Mrs. Beery? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Thank you. Very good. Passes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gregor Myers, and, and thank you also to Mr. Cole. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, next up is Resolution 2020-15, authorizing the sale of the 1992 Pierce Ladder Truck to the Putin Bay, Ohio Fire Department in the amount of $16,500 on Mr. Kirk. Chief Kirk, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council, as you know, uh, we've been working on the build-out of the new ladder truck, uh, which I'll report on during the director's report. Um, as we're very close to taking delivery of that. Um, throughout the year, last year, I was looking at avenues to um, see how we can best make the use of decommissioning our old ladder truck. Um, sometimes with the strict standards from the NFPA and the Insurance Services Office, it's difficult to try to sell these, um, even on gov deals and, and the like. Um, this truck has been out of service since September 14th of last year. Uh, it did not pass its aerial ladder test that we conduct on it annually to meet the standards. Uh, it bounced around from vendor to vendor to try to find um, 
people would be the most efficient use of our money to repair it. Um, there, were, there were a variety of different issues. Um, most of the quotes ranged from ten to twenty thousand dollars, and uh, we didn't want to put undue money into this truck as we were getting so close to um, taking delivery of a new one. When we finally found a repair shop that uh, we felt comfortable in exploring what some of the repairs we could do just to make it safe to operate so that we would have a vehicle in the city to serve the community and uh, to report to ISO with, um, the vendor, Pierce, I'm sorry, the manufacturer, Pierce, would not uh, certify that vendor to do the work. So we reached out uh, to get another vendor um, out in Fairport Harbor, where the truck was at most recently. Um, they were certified by the vendor. And uh, the quote that that repair shop had given us was for $10,000. Uh, we did not want to spend that money, especially as September quickly became October, and then December, uh, we were getting near and near delivery. Uh, so we held off on the repairs. Uh, meanwhile, um, I had interaction with the Putin Bay Fire Chief, and he had reached out and discussed um, some, bless you, some of the uh, service they were having on their trucks because uh, they used the same shop. And um, they determined they have a need for this type of ladder truck. Um, they have not had a ladder truck on the island of Putin Bay. They are a 100% volunteer fire department. Um, they're struggling for funding. Uh, they have raised some money to purchase a ladder truck, not nearly enough to purchase a new one yet. Um, so this was uh, very good timing for them as, as well as for us. Um, the ferries are not currently running from the island to the mainland, so they actually put a committee together, flew over to the mainland. Uh, I met them on February 14th out at Fairport Harbor, gave them a full demonstration of the ladder truck that we currently own, um, showed them all the deficiencies, gave them all the back service records dating back to the 90s as far as I could find, uh, to give them the history of the vehicle, and uh, they, they were very interested in it. So as, as indicated in my memo to you, uh, they had a, a meeting with the town trustees this evening, actually this afternoon, and uh, he did let me know that they did pass this, um, so I am bringing it to you. Um, we did deem that uh, this does not have any municipal purpose for us in the city here. Uh, furthermore, we don't have any space to store it indoors to keep it as like a reserve apparatus if we did want to put the money into it. Um, after conferring with the law director, um, we did make sure that we could sell this outright to the township uh, without um, any competitive bid bet, uh, bidding. Um, so, I request uh, respectfully that you approve uh, selling this decommissioned 1992 Pierce ladder truck uh, to Putin Bay Fire Department for the amount of $16,500 on emergency. And then I would also propose that that money be uh, reallocated into the Fire Department's capital fund for 2020 to try to buy some uh, budgetary relief in our capital requests. Uh, thank you, Chief Perko. The, the, uh, um, uh, I know that the Put Bay <coughs> Village trustees were having a meeting today at 4 p.m. Did we have them here back as to whether uh, they took any action? Yes, they did approve. They approved. Okay, so all we have to do now is we approve this. They've already approved, and uh, and like all of us who become too old to work for the city, we end up at Put Bay. <laughs> I hope that maybe I'll have <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, any questions for Chief? Was there any reason you said you looked on like the government websites and found that there were some difficulties selling these vehicles, especially in its current condition? Is there any option for for non-government sale? You know, might use it for a parade or other advertising purposes that you can do research into? Uh, sometimes. Folks in the tree business or, or, or collectors will bid on them on, on uh, different uh, pickup deals, but um, I, I was hopeful to get anywhere between fifteen and twenty thousand uh, dollars. I thought that would be exceptionally well for us. Um, I, and I don't know that that would happen or not. Putting it out for bid. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
I, I can say as an example, uh, the city of Shaker Heights had two decommissioned ladder trucks that uh, they had a very hard time getting rid of over the course of a two-year period. And they sold for a lesser price? Uh, I believe they ended up donating one to uh, the Cleveland Museum, Fire Museum. Not to mention you have to store it in the Correct. And maintain it. I understand that it's going to be one. <laughs> oh, sorry. A little lower price. Uh, all right. Uh, any other any other questions for uh, Chief Perkins? I kind of want to get a picture of it on the ferry going. On. <laughs> Just been picturing this ever since I heard about this. Yeah. There's a training opportunity, right? Yes, uh, yes. they did ask about training. Um, they, they reached out to the mechanic shop, actually, um, which they offered to do some uh, maintenance training for them. Um, so I talked to our maintenance officer and our training officer. Uh, they're more than willing to go over and assist with a training plan, so they were very appreciative of that. And uh, they said they would uh, work out the details here on approval. Yeah. One more reason to go to Putin yeah. is to go down to the fire station and post their own truck. <laughs> All right. Anything further? Is there a uh, is there a motion? Uh, is there a motion to approve on emergency resolution 20, 2015 authorizing the sale of the 1992 Pierce ladder truck to the Putin Bay, Ohio Fire Department, amount of 16.5 and. Respecting the chief's point, if we could earmark those funds for uh, the, the fire department apparatus. I, I think you wanted to, to help outfit the, the new ladder truck with this money, is that right? Correct. Because okay. there are a few items that, that we apparently did not order. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, McCombo? Yes. Uh, the portion of the separate resolution that's necessary in order to make that. We're not appropriate in your cell. No, I'm talking about the, 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 the manner in which these the funds are used is not is not specified in this ordinance. That's correct. So mm -hmm. um, what that would mean is that those funds are going to the general fund. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I guess, I guess, based on what the chief was saying, is, is there, is it appropriate for, you know, we can discuss whether we want to do it this way, but is it even appropriate to consider earmarking the 16.5 once it comes down to the fire department? Yeah, but I mean, I, I, Dennis, I'll, I'll defer to you, but my, my answer to that is that would, that would be a budgetary function, you would do that in your budget. It's traditionally, uh, we don't have a policy that stipulates um, disposal of assets. That's something I think I had told everybody I was working on the fixed asset policy to bring back to you. Um, normally what happens is the money would revert to the fund that expended the original cost of acquisition. So in this case, that came out of the capital improvement fund. So that money, in my estimation, should go back into the capital improvement fund as opposed to the general fund. So, so whether it all so we don't have enough appropriation so, because it's going right there. So Chief, I understand what you're saying is that since you're giving up this asset, you would, want, uh, you would hope that we would consider that as we're making decisions for the budget, and certainly I'll keep that in mind, and I'm sure the other members of council will. Since it's not here in this ordinance, it would be necessarily used for that purpose, but it sounds like it'll go back to capital fund. I think we can all make a memo that the 16 o'clock should make its way over the fire department. So, Mayor, uh, I would uh, make a, a motion to pass the resolution authorizing the sale of the 1992 Pierce Ladder Truck on emergency for the amount of $16,500 to the Ohio Fire Department. Sounds very good. That's in order. Uh, motion, by, uh, motion by Mr. Gould uh, to pass this resolution on emergency. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Holmes. Uh, any discussion? Saying none, uh, Mrs. Thomas will do two, two votes. Uh, first, on the suspension of the rules. 
Mrs. Plainville? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Rudd? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Any of them on the main motion? Mrs. Plainville? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Wise? Aye. Mr. Rudd? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Retirement approved. Um, resolution passes. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Burke. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we will I'll repeat. We'll recall now that we had an added item. Item K uh, is the motion to accept the uh, 2020 Community Recycling Awareness Grant um, in the amount of $6,000 for the City of University Heights uh, for the purpose of implementing certain activities listed in the grant. Uh, I'll, I'll speak briefly as to this. Uh, uh, this, this is a grant uh, for uh, four outdoor recycling containers. Uh, signage is required for those containers, as well as for some magnets, postcards, and bags for the new homeowner packets. We already do that to some extent, but at some point we run out of those items. And, and then finally, there's also a portion of <clears throat> an award of 400 free reusable shopping bags for the community for our distribution. Uh, Miles from those bags are available for pickup, which may not be until late spring. <clears throat> uh, this particular grant, uh, we received word uh, this morning, um, late this morning, that, that we uh, won this grant and uh, they have requested that we sign a return the form accepting it by February 28th. Our next council meeting wasn't until March, thus necessitating. Thus, making it desirable to add it, you know, to the agenda today, even on such short notice. Uh, this is a six thousand uh, dollar. It is a six thousand dollar grant. The grant application itself called for about sixty-seven hundred and change in, um, in, in in for the project that that we were proposing to do, uh, and then we would be reimbursed six thousand dollars. So we'd be out of pocket a little over seven hundred dollars for what we would be doing here. Perhaps. Um, the more notable thing that I would like to mention here on the record is that <clears throat> this particular grant was the first grant that was written and, and applied for by our by Brendan Zach, who is uh, joined our city um, uh, about a year and a half ago, first as an intern, and uh, was here for a couple of semesters and wanted to keep him when, uh, when he was a recipient of a of a of an internship opportunity that was uh, funded by uh, I think the Cleveland Foundation. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Cleveland Foundation to go uh, do an exterior maintenance program uh, in the city of Brooklyn, and uh, I hated to see him go because I saw so much potential in Mr. Zach, and we, we made it clear to him that he was welcome back uh, to join us uh, and, and, and keep doing the great work he'd been doing city and he, he took us up on that. So he's finishing up his senior year at CSU. He's working part-time for us uh, with a, an entry-level city planner, um, Titan, and uh, he has uh, earned for us his very first grant uh, on behalf of the city. And Patrick has a running total of his grants. Chief Perko has a running total of his grants. Those numbers have become impressive over the years. And I believe that we this is the very first of, of a long line of grants I hope Mr. Zach would be successful on for us. I remember quipping at some point when Mr. Zach was coming back that we had found ourselves the next Patrick. I didn't mean to be so prescient about that, but the thing is is that uh, I think the young man has a bright future here at the City of University Heights, and uh, I think uh, this is just a glimpse of some very good work that we're doing for us here. So, so um, it's uh, something fitting about you know being able to receive this uh, here at this evening uh, with, with Patrick here at his last meeting and, and, and with uh, all the training that, that Mr. Zach has obtained from Mr. Griffin Myers, uh, as well as Mrs. Griffin, they've all worked very closely together um, in the course of the last year and a half. So, that all said, any questions about the grant or anything else with respect to this? I know Mr. Gould had a couple questions for me offline, uh, separate from this discussion. But I think I covered those answers here. Just have one question about the outdoor recycling containers. Yes. Are they going to be sort of city hall for people to come and what's the purpose of those? 
No, no, I think the idea here is to have these containers out in the community. We already have some waste cans that are out in the community. Oh, they're going to be like waste or something? Like yes, okay. yes, so, so we can have these, these cans out there uh, as additional places to leave your recyclables. Okay. Rather than throw away your can and recycle. Yes, what are the questions? I, I was just going to ask, do you plan on putting them by the bus stops or just wherever? Wherever they're placed now, you maybe close put a second one. I put a recycling one next to a regular one. I think that's right. I, uh, Patrick, um, you may be more familiar with the grant application than, than I am. Uh, is, does that sound right to you? That's correct. The The goal is that it would be paired with a trash can to pose the alternative uh, to the trash can. I, I thought that was right, but I didn't want to guess. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? Is there a motion to accept the grant <coughs> from the uh, Congress County Salt Waste District uh, in the amount of $6,000? So, there's a motion by. Mr. Gould, is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Berry. Any discussion? Okay, seeing that, Mrs. Thomas, will you call the roll? Mrs. Bell? Aye. Mrs. Berry? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Rock? Aye. Mr. Gould? Aye. Okay, very good. Motion is passed. Uh, next item is a motion to hold an executive session to the following regular meeting for the purpose of discussing personal, legal, and or real estate matters. I have nothing that I would ask the council of that would require an executive session. So unless the council has something, uh, I don't believe there'll be any motion at this time. All right, very good. That takes us then to reports, finance. <clears throat> Mr. Kennedy, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just, as the mayor had indicated earlier uh, in his comments, a revised budget also was sent out late uh, this evening, uh, just prior to the CFC meeting. So I would uh, look forward to having a chance to discuss that tomorrow evening with the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, I would caution, I still have to go through there and put that together pretty quick, but um, I think the changes from my first review of it all were accepted. We've had some system problems with doing dual systems, uh, but I'll follow that through again tomorrow to, to let everybody know, but I would um, ask that everybody take a look at that before tomorrow night's meeting. Um, I also sent out um, late in the day an income statement, an expense report, a revenue report, and a report uh, for Fifth Third on our investment portfolio, all for the month of January. They're very voluminous. Um, I apologize for that. Until I get this conversion with this new system that, that we're trying to implement, I'm about 60% done with that. And ideally, when we get that done, I'll be able to sit down with each one of you. You tell me what you want to see, and we can program that reporting. Somebody may want to focus on revenue, somebody may want to focus on expense, um, audit trails, whatever. We can build those reports that will be generated out of the system, um, and you can access those yourself through a dashboard uh, that you'll be able to um, access through the web. So I said, oh, I'm about 60% done with that. I apologize for a lot of the conversion and transition type issues that have come up. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be good. It'll be good from a transparency standpoint for the community as well. Um, related to the investments, as you know, we took some investment money out for the operating account. Uh, we recently received our uh, second advance from the county for property taxes. So um, cash-wise, we're doing a little better, so I'm going, I promised you to take a look at um, what the prospects were for paying some or all of that money back into the portfolio. So I hope to have that done by the end of the month. Um, we're, we have an audit conference scheduled for next week for anybody who's interested. Um, I believe that's 8.15 in the morning on the 26th. Uh, the auditors have been there for three or four weeks, um, keeping us busy, so we're, we're going at a good pace with them. But I, I would offer that invitation to everybody to come to that meeting. It should not be fairly lengthy, but um, be a good opportunity to familiarize yourself with the difference between the state auditors and uh, private auditors that the city's used in the past. That is, uh, it's 8.15 a.m. Um, in the uh, 
Oh, it'll be at the end. Yes, it, it is at the end. So 2245 Lawrenceville. But you, you have been. Yes. Um, yes, that would be 815 on Wednesday the 26th. And um, I, anybody has any questions on any of those financial reports, please let me know. Look forward to talking about the budget a little bit more tomorrow night. And I would personally like to say thank you to Patrick. I've only been here a few months, but he's a human filing cabinet. <laughs> and he is a wealth institution of knowledge, which I, I sorely miss. And I told him I would continue to call him. And I know people in Maple Heights, so you have to call me back. Um, but he's been great. Uh, it, very nice guy, and I wish him the best. And then the, the finance meeting is tomorrow at 6 30. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. This is why she has Thank you. How's the intern uh, prospects looking? Finance interns? Finance. Um, I have like four or five candidates. So we got through the whole budget and seeing where we're at. And, you know, I kind of held that off. We have two part-time interns that work for the city and other capacities already. Um, I'd like, like I said, to get somebody that's got some kind of expertise in technology and the cutting corners that, that I think could benefit everybody in terms of production of reports, and analytics, and those types of things. So. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mrs. Weiss. Anybody, anything further for Mr. Kennedy? All right, seeing none, uh, next report, Director of Law, Cliff McConnell. Thank you, Mayor. I um, want to report to Council that um, you may recall, um, I believe in December of last year, Council authorized um, uh, the city to enter into a letter of intent with the uh, Cleveland Heights University Heights School Board uh, regarding um, the purchase of parcels in the residential attached district. Um, we have successfully negotiated um, a purchase agreement based on that letter of intent. Um, and it's anticipated that we'll be entering into that agreement um, imminently. Um, in addition, we're in the process of uh, negotiating a development agreement with Kinez um, related to um, transfer of those parcels to Knez once we've acquired all of them. So the residential um, attached district project um, is very close to um, um, becoming much more real here in the city. Um, Mr. Gould had forwarded to me a proposed anti-discrimination ordinance. Uh, I will be reviewing that prior to the next meeting and you can anticipate that on the next agenda. Um, I'm meeting this coming Monday with Mr. Grover Myers and Mrs. Blankfeld regarding rental registration ordinance um, and related concerns. Uh, Mrs. Blankfeld will be asking me to um, take a look at um, existing regulations in other communities related to Airbnb facilities. I will have a memo um, on that out to all of council um, sometime this week so that we can add that to our list. Of very good. Thank you, Mr. McConnell. Mm -hmm. This is what's. Well I just had a question. So, is that going to be going to committee after the memo, or how's that going to happen? Yes. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. McConnell? Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. We'll move on to public safety, starting with police. Chief Rogers. No reporter. Thank you, Chief. Fire. Chief Perka. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two items to report on. Uh, two weeks ago, ISO met with us, um, gave us an analysis of our department. Uh, we have not received back the final report yet. Uh, we're probably uh, about a month out from that. Um, we, we did learn of some things that uh, we could try to do better as far as uh, our training and our, our operational deployment. Um, one thing that was notable, um, was that we did not have an in-service ladder truck that passed the aerial testing. Um, so hopefully here we have an opportunity now to get that uh, out-of-service ladder truck off of our books and press this new ladder truck into service. And I'm hopeful that uh, we will just squeak in on the timeline so that we can uh, retain those points 
um, that we've had before for a ladder truck because uh, ISO does require our city to have that and uh, I, th I think we will be good with that. Um, that said, as I indicated, we were down to Columbus yesterday. We conducted the final inspection on the ladder truck. Uh, that project started in early 2018, so it's been a long road. Uh, we've had uh, seven committee members uh, put a lot of time and effort into this, a lot of trips down to Columbus. Uh, we're fortunate to have a vendor that, that really worked with us. This, this truck is extremely custom. In, in fact, uh, this particular truck has got a, a lot of um, first of the time things that this company has done. Um, this is mainly due to the size and age of the building that it's going into. Uh, we had length restrictions and height restrictions um, that really narrowed down the vendors and then even as this one um, was able to meet those restrictions, uh, we still ran into issues along the way with the build process, um, lowering the height, uh, required different things uh, like the water tank, the, the amount of gallons of water in there to be changed, and all these things play into part with uh, your ISO rating, having the right amount of hose, the right amount of water, the right amount of uh, portable ground ladders on the ladder truck. So uh, it, it was a very tedious process, but uh, the committee as well as the uh, company were able to pull it off and uh, it looks fantastic and I think it will serve the community very well. It should be uh, making its delivery up to Richfield, Ohio uh, this Friday, hopefully. And then um, next week, uh, the build out of it will continue as far as mounting equipment, installing communications, and the like. Um, and once we get here, uh, training will commence. So I'm sure that uh, by the next council meeting, I'll be able to report to when we'll likely try to put the truck in service. Very good. Thank you, Chief Burke. Any questions for the Chief? All right. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Next up is uh, service. Jeff McCorney, Mr. McCorney, you have Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I just had three items I wanted to make Council and the public aware of. Uh, our household hazardous waste collection and paper shredding will be held March 7th, Saturday, March 7th, from 9 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. We also are open for drop-offs the Friday before on the 6th. So that will be conducted. That's time change weekend. Uh, and then we'll hold another one in November at the time change weekend. Uh, we'll post these th items also out on the web as, as we are going to. Uh, secondly, I'm uh, scheduling a uh, tree pruning and removal seminar so that uh, people have the opportunity to voice their opinion about our tree program, including planting. So prior to the next council meeting on March 2nd, we will hold a meeting at 6 o'clock here with the city arborist, Jason Knowles, um, people from Parks Tree, that's the company that we have a contract with doing the tree trimming, and myself. And we won't field any questions people have regarding our tree pruning and or removal program along with our planting. Last, on Wednesday, April 8th, we will be doing a Passover food collection in the morning. Anytime they can put it out from, uh, from dawn uh, until noon. Afternoon, we will not have time to collect any more material. It'll take us that amount of hours in the morning to collect Passover food items. So that'll be Wednesday, April 8th, Passover food collection from dawn to noon. That concludes my report. And you did say that was tied to the curb. Yes. Correct. We don't have the equipment to do more than. Uh, we'll be running a regular Wednesday rubbish route that day as well. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Percorni. I, I, I know that there was a formal inquiry that I haven't formally responded to, but as you and I discussed, we were approving that, and I'm glad that you mentioned it this evening. Sure. So, yes, we will do a massive collection. <coughs> Very good. Very good. Any questions for Mr. McCormick? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, building department. Uh, Mr. McCormick. No department. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McCormick. City Engineer Joe Chuney. 
No report this evening there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Communications and civic engagement, Mr. Cook. Good evening. Good evening. Some good news about um, our city magazine, Mosaic. It will be hitting mailboxes next week, probably Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, we'll have advanced copies at City Hall, possibly as early as tomorrow. Well, we're um, I had a bet on it, I'd say Friday, but I'll um, we'll let you know once they arrive. You want to get a sneak peek, if not, you get one in your mailbox next week. And also, as you know, we partner with the Cleveland Jewish News to uh, publish our magazine. They take care of the ad sales for us, so that we get a 30% cut of that. I'm pleased to report that for this issue, we've set an all time sales record. And to be clear, it's not an all time sales record for our magazine. It's an all-time sales record for every city magazine that <clears throat> that Cleveland Jewish News does. So that includes Beachwood, South Euclid, Lyndhurst, and Cleveland Heights. I mean, it's not a competition, but um, <laughs> um, please report that thirteen thousand forty-one dollars and fifty cents in ads are sold. So our commission on that will be about um, almost four thousand dollars. I'm optimistic that the summer issue. Or even higher because ad wise the advantage we have in the summer is that people are companies are advertising their summer camps so if we sell all the ads that we sold for this issue plus throw in a couple camp ads and looking that'll be even higher and so um but i think one reason pardon me, um that the ad sales are so high is again as i've said before when i report on ad sales that i think the the a community of the advertisers are pleased with the work of this mayor, this council, and the administration. And also, I want to um, thank Susan Drucker for her support on this and by creating a, a business a business friendly environment in the city and helping bring in new businesses. And some of the new businesses in town are now advertising the magazine. So I think um, I think that helps. It's a team effort, and we're looking forward to that issue coming out uh, this week or next week. Thank you, Mr. Cook. I, I, you know, when, when I first heard the news that 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 we had the, that kind of record ad sales and that the, you know, the businesses, most of those businesses being in our community, uh, are, are this committed to advertising and, and reaching, you know, the residents of this city this way. Um, it is. Uh, it's gratifying. It's mm -hmm. gratifying because we knew that when we set out to do this magazine, we were taking a chance. We didn't know if, if, if it wouldn't just be a one issue wonder and then it would peter out after that. This there, there's a lot of demand here, right. and and uh, it's it's it, it, and, and also like you said, it's also a testament to uh, the the merchants in this community feeling engaged uh, with what the city's doing, uh, largely through the efforts of, of our economic development development department which means the efforts of Susan Drucker so thank you Susan and um, you know there are there are a lot of people responsible for you know the success of this magazine and, and uh, you know a lot of it's also very good writing which is uh, a lion's share of which you know, I don't need to and, and, and I appreciate you for what you do there too. Thank you for that I mean well I can take credit for some of the articles but obviously um, Kathan from the school district contributes one each issue uh, Kate Malone from the university and her staff contribute one. Uh, Gina contributes uh, the magazine or the restaurant review each month. And um, Diane, who volunteers uh, as a freelancer, contributes the small business spotlight article. So yeah, it's a team effort recruiting, you know, talented people to to write. And you know, we'll just keep going. Forward. All right. Very good. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Cook? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Uh, next up is um, uh, Economic Development, Susan Drucker. Thank you, Mayor and Council. A uh, couple of announcements with some businesses. Um, I've mentioned previously Chocolate Emporium is, um, has moved into 2169 South Green Road. That's the form of our sushi place, so um, so they're back because uh, they were here a, little, a, long time, a while ago, so, um, so it's nice to have them back. Um, also, um, Handel's Homemade Ice Cream and Yogurt has submitted plans. Uh, they would, um, are looking to move into uh, 2261 Warrensville Center Road. That's the former O&P Services. That's, that's the building. Um, um, so it would be Bialy's. Then there's the space next to Bialy's. Um, and then there is a, a salon going in. And then there will be the Handel's Ice Cream. 
So they submitted plans to build that uh, location out. So um, uh, when those when that gets closer to coming to fruition with the grand opening, I will let you know. Um, also, um, I am working right now with Citizens Bank and helping to get the word out for the Small Business Community Champion Award. This is an award that honors small businesses um, as they make their extraordinary <coughs> contributions to not only um, the citizens, but the community they live in and how they affect lives of their customers. So this award is sponsored by Citizens Bank and um, it's eligible owners of small businesses um, in the greater Cleveland area. So I um, have pushed that out to all of our businesses. They are aware of it, uh, that they can submit an application. It's up to, it could be a $10,000 or $20,000 award that this small business, each small business um, who would be um, could possibly receive this if you were um, chosen, and um, I do. I have heard back from uh, four of our businesses that are going to take advantage of this, and um, um, so it doesn't mean that more aren't going to. But at least four of them did respond that um, that uh, they are interested in pursuing this. Um, wanted to give a little bit of an update. Um, has to do with University Square. I've been getting, as, as you know, with that one building with Cold Stone Creamery, where that former Cold Stone Creamery was in the Verizon building, there are four units. I've been receiving uh, several calls from potential retailers looking to want to locate in that space. So what I want everyone to understand is that is considered phase two of the University Square proposed development. So the developer is not looking to lease that out. That is a building that could get, it could be leased out 100%, but what you would look, look to is they can't commit to more than possibly 18 months to two years because then they're ready for phase two. So no one's gonna come in, do a complete build out, move in, and then by that time have maybe one year to 18 months. So I just wanted, to, if, if you hear anything, um, I just wanted to remind people that's why that space is not being filled. It has already, it's earmarked for phase two of a grander redevelopment plan. So I just wanted to remind um, uh, the public I do. And, and when I get the calls from these potential retailers, I then forward that on to Brad Cowan so he knows who's interested because there have been several businesses that are interested in locating in the re retail spaces that will be provided even in phase one. So I just forward those to Brad and then and turn the conversations over so that uh, the developer can have direct conversations with any potential retailer coming in. Um, and then, um, Councilman Rock, I will be reaching out to you for a meeting. I'm very anxious. I already have a little agenda all ready for you, so um, so I'll I'll email you and we can um, coordinate some dates, possibly for um, hopefully. I, I know Council will be busy with the budget, but maybe in March we can get the committee together. So. Um, and then finally, I would just like to thank Patrick Rogan Myers. It has been an absolute pleasure working with Patrick. We work hand in hand every day, so um, uh, I am going to miss him greatly. I think we've done a lot of good work together, um, and I want to wish him well in your new chapter in your new career, so, or your continued career, I should say. So um, thank you very much. That's my report for the time. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Drucker. Any questions for Mrs. Drucker? Just one, the Handel's ice cream is that one that Oh, I yes, it's popular. They still have a location actually in um, Twinsburg. It's seasonal when it's open, though. Yeah. Um, so yes, that is the same. Same uh, brand. Yeah. 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 I mean, now that you brought it up again, I'll feel free to go there. When, when I when I, I I spent part of my childhood in Youngstown, and and I used to ride my bike. You know, I would ride past the Dairy Queen and go that extra mile and go to the Handles. And the Handles was the best ice cream I knew when I was a kid. And the idea that's going to be you know, <laughs> that area of the so state as well, so he knows exactly what I'm talking about. He'll probably be at the front of the line with me. <laughs> well, I think his official sorry. capacity is that going to be that. Sure, but, but, but we know what we're in for, and, and, I, and to know that it's as short a walk from City Hall as Bialy, so I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank you. no offense to Ben and Jerry's, who's already here. So you like Ben and Jerry's. Thank you, Mrs. Grogan. Mr. Grogan Myers, Housing and Community Development. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's it's 
and on Experience 3, giving my last director's report I was thinking about. I've been involved with University Heights for the last 11 years since I moved up here from Columbus to go to John Carroll. Uh, so from being a, a resident through on the, the last five years full-time and, and seven years total working for the residents and working with you, uh, it's, it's a lot to process and a lot to take in. So I, I'm very thankful and, and grateful to your guidance and working with you and taking so much of what I've learned here with me. Um, so, of course, I, I don't know how to stop uh, working, and so I'll, I'll just kind of like skid right into 4.30 next Wednesday. Um, but so I, I have a couple things I, I wanted to bring up. Um, the first was, uh, last meeting I had mentioned that the, the Housing and Community Development Department was working on the 2020 program for the Exterior Maintenance Program. This is the systematic inspection that we do every year, uh, and working our way through the community every five years, um, making sure that we're keeping up the housing stock here in the city. So uh, one of the questions that Councilman Pardee had uh, asked was, can you identify for us which area of town we'll be in this year? Um, part of what I did uh, in working with our city planner, Brendan Zach, um, we have a GIS subscription that helps us create high quality, uh, high detail uh, maps to be able to put out into the community through our website as well as uh, in nice print form. Um, so part of what I've done and, and we'll be passing around here um, is a, a set of two, two maps. The first is um, what I'm calling year A. So this is what will be inspected this year. Um, for those who don't have any from them, it'll be the southwest corner of the city uh, roughly bounded by uh, the, the Properties on Eaton Road uh, through the Southern Corporation line, um, just uh, west of Warrensville, not including the properties on Warrensville, and approximately south of Hillbrook. Um, and then on the second page is the full five-year rotation as mapped out. Um, the, the goal being that we're going to hit between uh, 800 and 900 properties a year, um, owing to, to Dennis's. Um, filing cabinet reference. There's 4,256 single and two family parcels here in the city of University Heights. Uh, so that's the magic number that we work towards in trying to decide, um, you know, just get a reasonable amount of properties each year in that five year rotation. Um, when I started as director, um, I saw various elements of, of a cycle. I wanted to put something on, in paper, uh, in a commitment to the community, uh, recommitting to the community, uh, this exterior maintenance program. Um, so this is on the website. Um, I, I will continue to review just to make sure it's crystal clear that, um, you know, that we're starting in year A. The notices will be going out to the community within the next two weeks. So that notice will go out to those properties highlighted in red, um, which are the program year 2020 homes that will be inspected. Um, so that that answers that question. I know that uh, I promised council an answer to. Um, and then I know that I'll be gone, but hopefully uh, Mr. Zach will be here uh, or with Mayor Brennan. Um, we are currently under review for the Community Development Supplemental Grant application. Those are for the Cedar Taylor Streetscape uh, improvements. Hopefully this is the year. Fingers crossed this is the year. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and thanks to, to County Councilwoman Cheryl Stevens who wrote a a glowing letter of recommendation to include with our application. We had a, a letter of recommendation as well from Cleveland Heights and then the local development association. So I think we've got a strong application. I think this year's the year. So, end of the report. Very good. Uh, I, can't, I can't do something to do. Thank you. Sorry to ask if there are any questions for Patrick Irving. No, I just wanted to say, um, I don't know if Patrick remembers, but the first time we met, it was at John Carroll, and I'm not exactly sure what you were doing, something with audio-visual. That was the class I was taking, so. Um, no, so I just, I want to wish you the best of luck, and not with just this, with your future career. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pat. That takes us now to Council Committee's Building and Housing 
Mrs. Whitefeld. No report this evening, Mayor. Community outreach, Mrs. Carney. She was excused from tonight's meeting. Does anybody have a report from that committee? Seeing none, economic development. Uh, now, Mr. Ross. No report yet. No? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> fire, that. Finance, Mrs. Weiss. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I want to thank the mayor for. Here and I hope this is we're going to get past this and work collaboratively. There's still a lot of work to do on the budget for sure. Um, some tweaking. Um, we have a finance committee meeting on Thursday, tomorrow at 6 30 at the annex. Um, the goal is really to hopefully get this um, approved to be able to pass it to council on the first, the first meeting of March. That's the goal. I think we're 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 getting there. So. Worst case scenario, it could be an emergency of the second reading um, for the second meeting in March. But so that's kind of the game plan for now. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Uh, recreation, Mr. Ertl. He was excused from tonight's meeting. Does anybody have anything from that committee? Oh, Mrs. Spark. Uh, the paperwork that I annually submit to the Pentagon went to Cleveland FAA, has come back from Cleveland FAA, is on its way back to the Pentagon. So hopefully we'll get approved for a flyover for the Memorial Day Parade, and hopefully they will not have mechanical issues <laughs> and have to skip us like they did last year. Fingers crossed. All right, very good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Mrs. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, safety. Well, that would be Mrs. <coughs> 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 Uh, service utilities, Mr. Cool. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll, I'll reach out uh, to Captain to set a meeting so we can discuss the fact that we're going to try to reflect the meetings to the discussion so we can discuss uh, budget issues um, and how they're going to do that. So that's the that we do. I've also reached out to NOPEC. Um, they offer a no mock program yes. for utilities, so it's yes. part of the utility functional service. Um, I'd like to discuss the potential of bringing that program to University Heights before the uh, summer door to door knocking on the grant starts. Uh, so we have another option for our citizens to prevent that type of event. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Gould. Was that it? Was that, that was it? it? Oh, very good. I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, very good. Then, uh, Community the Whole, Mrs. Morris. No, we very good. We have reached the conclusion of our agenda this evening. Uh, there is a finance committee meeting tomorrow at 6.30 at the Annex, that's 2245 Lawrenceville. Uh, and uh, our next regular meeting is the first Monday in March. So without further ado, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, motion by Mrs. Blankfeld, second by Mrs. Tobias, Mrs. Thomas, we call the roll. Blankfeld. Aye. Mr. Berry. Aye. Mr. Blankfeld. Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you.